Friends, welcome. Welcome to Wellesley Village Church on this, the second Sunday of Advent. We are so delighted to have all of you here together today, whether this is one of your first times worshiping with us or whether this has been your church home for decades or anywhere in between. We hope that you feel very much at home in this place knowing that you are part of the beloved family of God, each and every one of you, that this is a time when we gather in God's love and grace and peace and hope. And we are touched by that, and we're changed by that. That's my hope and my prayer for you, for all of us together in this time of worship. A special welcome to any who may be worshiping with us at home. I'm waving to the cameras up there. We're glad that you have tuned in from wherever you are. Wellesley Village Church is an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, which means that whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey of faith and life, you are completely welcome here because you matter. All of you matters. You matter to God and you matter to us. There's a special statement about what it means for us to be an open and affirming congregation in the bulletin if you'd like to read more. And of course, as a member of the denomination, the United Church of Christ, we are connected to the larger church that shares those values with us. I wish you a joyful third, second Sunday of Advent today and a joyful third Sunday of Advent next week. <laughs> Let us pray. Holy God, you are here and we are here and we are here and you are here. And we are grateful to share this sacred time together. We're grateful for the holy beauty of this season, for the music, the words of scripture, the prayer, the communion we will share. We're grateful for all of the ways you are still speaking God and you will speak to us yet. So open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits, that we might anticipate your coming to us, even now, through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Mighty God, in this season when we keep awake seeking the Prince of Peace, we confess that we have not made the way for peace in our own lives. Forgive us, O oh God, for our inattention to the violence, exploitation, and exclusion that deny peace. We confess we are distracted and divided and deluded. We seek our own security and power and wealth, even as it harms others. Forgive us, O oh God, for tolerating the intolerable indifference towards suffering that the princes and principalities of this world have constructed. Forgive us, O oh God, for accepting silence, assent, and injustice, rather than holding out, demanding the just peace that you desire. Show us the way, wonderful counselor, as we prepare for peace to reign on earth and in the depths of our own hearts. Through Jesus Christ, who is to come. Amen. Beloved children of the everlasting Mother and Father, hear this good news. God is lifting up the lowly and sending the powerful away. We are forgiven for the ways that we forsake peace of our own benefit, and we are called into solidarity with all who are oppressed. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we continue our Advent journey today, we light the candles of hope and peace, and we welcome new members, Sarah and Brian and Daniel Hall, as our candle lighters. We hear the prophet proclaiming, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the calf and the lion and the yearling will lie down together, and a little child shall lead them. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain for the earth shall be filled with peace. As we light the second Advent candle, let us brighten our hearts with hope and peace, for the promised one is coming. The hope and peace of the coming one be with you. 
please share a sign of hope and peace with one another. Beloved, our scripture text for this morning comes from the very first chapter of Luke's Gospel, beginning in the 46th verse. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. God's mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me? God, who turns all things upside down, be with us and help us to see in a new way. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Church, in the installation liturgy last week, there was a line that you may or may not have caught, in which you all promised to give Bob and myself, quote, due honor and support. <laughs> we had a little laugh, just like that, ahead of Sunday as we reviewed the text. After all, exactly how much honor is due to us? Is a different amount of honor due to different kinds of people? Is there an increase based on your title or years of service or your training, which seminary you went to? Is there some calculation out there that I have missed? And our pastors do more or less honor than other professions. Of course, that was a joke shared in good fun since we feel honored to serve in this congregation and well supported by the residency program. But as with so much of humor, underneath the veneer of the joke was a foundation of a sharper truth. We are taught, we all are taught in so many different spaces that different honor is due to different people, depending on their wealth or their status or their authority. Even while our faith teaches us that all people made in God's image are due honor and support, even and especially, when worldly powers and practices dishonor them for who they are. This scripture text from the beginning of Luke's gospel is just one of many Christian sacred texts that proclaim that the dishonored of the world are honored by God, from ancient psalms to contemporary prayers. 
Now, I am certain that this is my Catholic upbringing in a family full of strong and faithful women speaking, but I think that Mary, to whom this poetic text is attributed, does not get the honor due to her in many Christian spaces. We are all eager to confine her to Advent and Christmas and Holy Week, and even then we shrink her down to a mostly silent mother, with the main exception of this text. We squeeze her into just her joy at her son's birth and her pain at his death with little consideration before or between. This text, though, helps to reveal how much more Mary is if we can allow her to be. Mary is an unmarried young woman whose consent makes the coming of Jesus possible. Mary is a faithful Jewish woman, humble before God and her community's history. And above all, in this scripture text, Mary is the remarkable, pregnant prophetess of God's upside-down kingdom. First, her consent, earlier in this chapter of Luke's Gospel, provided a vision of bearing the Son of the Most High God by messengers. Mary says, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. That she is given an opportunity to say yes reveals how God co-creates in this world with humanity. And when she says yes, she makes way for Jesus, Prince of Peace, to come into the world. Mary's faith in the God of her people's history is the context for that yes. The Magnificat, as the scripture text that I just read is known, is one of the earliest known Christian hymns, and its imagery is firmly anchored in the Hebrew Bible's salvation history. From Abraham to the strong arm reference to the Exodus story and beyond as Mary even echoes Hannah's song of praise when her son Samuel was born. Mary's song emphasizes the power of God's redeeming presence through a history of covenant, of promises made with the people of Israel. That salvation history is only emphasized when we consider this text's place in traditional Christian liturgy. The opening hymn that we just sang, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, is an interpretation of a series of antiphons, or proclamatory prayers, that are traditionally spoken before reading or singing the Magnificat in the week leading up to Christmas. Worshippers cry out in prayer in the seven successive services to God as wisdom, leader of Israel, root of Jesse's stem, key of David, radiant dawn, ruler of all nations, and finally, Emmanuel, God with us. All before reading the text of Mary's song of praise to God. The O antiphons, as these prayers are known, also trace God's redeeming presence with humanity throughout history, from creation to Christ remembering God's work among our ancestors and crying out for knowledge, freedom, peace, and salvation. And if you missed those references, you will have another opportunity to reflect on them as the choir presents another interpretation of this song later in the service. Placed side by side as they are in traditional worship and our worship as well, These prayers and song form a tradition of remembering God's presence with us, Emmanuel. God's presence with us and our ancestors, familial and spiritual throughout history. They help us to remember the history of hope that the birth of Jesus and the coming of God's kingdom represents. Mary's recollection of this history illustrates her hope-filled faith in God's saving presence. This proclamation of a salvation history filled with God's justice is nothing short of a remarkable declaration of faith, considered in its context. And I recognize one piece of that history in a perhaps unexpected place this week, 
at a Hanukkah Havdalah celebration last night. As I think many of you know, tonight is the last night of Hanukkah, a holiday that traditionally celebrates the successful Maccabean revolt that put a Jewish king back on the Jewish throne after Greek imperial rule and restored the temple back to being fit for sacrifices to God again after having been desecrated by a conquering army. That revolt's success was short-lived with only 130 years of Jewish rule over Judea and fewer than 50 of those independent of conquering kingdoms. At the end of that 130-year time period, non-Jewish King Herod the Great was instead placed on the throne and ruled Judea as a subservient kingdom under the Roman Empire. Herod the Great. That same Herod, who you may recognize, was ruler when Jesus was born. This revolt, ancient history to us, celebrated generation to generation by our Jewish siblings, was relatively recent history to Mary. The start of that revolt was roughly only as distant to her as the American Civil War is to us. The transitions from independent rule to conquered Jewish rule and finally non-Jewish Roman imperial rule over Judea would have occurred roughly in Mary's grandparents' and parents' lifetimes. So Mary, who proclaims God's favor, mercy, and strength, holds within her as well the generational memory of hopes crushed by defeat. The faith that Mary expresses in the Magnificat, faith in a God who has remained faithful, in turn, in covenant with Israel, with strength and help, is a bold and resilient faith, one that overcomes the despair of yet another experience of occupation and subjugation. Faithfully Jewish, Mary would have known that for all the promise that the covenant held, Her people had been conquered in turn by Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Macedonian, Seleucid Greek, and finally Roman empires. In other words, Mary's hope-filled faith in God's justice is unlikely, given the history that it holds at the same time, and yet she holds it all still. That is why, rooted in history, I also describe this Magnificat as a work of prophecy. Mary's song describes how God's action in history continues to the day in which she is speaking and will continue into the future. Her words speak hard to stomach truth to those in power, even against the evidence that she and her ancestors have experienced. Mary, poor prophetess, claims God's favor and in doing so recognizes the upside-down nature of God's kingdom compared with the invading, corrupt, or power-hungry human kingdoms she and her people were familiar with. What is the hope that we proclaimed last Sunday for the first week of Advent? Our hope in this season is that God has and will make all things new. The hope is all about God's kingdom, about a belief that this kingdom or kingdom or community in which God reigns, that kingdom is coming to upset the norms and expectations of human-made kingdoms, powers, and orders that our ancestors have known and that we have known. Now this week on Peace Sunday, we can recognize through Mary's song that in God's upside-down kingdom, peace reigns. The kind of peace where all who are hungry have been made full. All who are lowly are lifted up. All who have been made to feel weak will be strong. All who would be scorned, like an unmarried pregnant young woman, will be lifted up and called blessed. That is not a peace that can be held in place by powers and armies. It is not a peace from which profit can be extracted. It is a prophetic peace, 
spoken as a witness against subjugation and injustice, spoken as a warning for those who would go against God's way. It is the peace which, as Paul writes, surpasses all human understanding. Peace that comes to us through Christ, the prince of peace in this upside-down kingdom. A prince born to wrestle with sin and death and make a way for something new. Who better to speak the truth of this coming upside-down kingdom to all those who are in power than the one who paves a way for it with her yes? The one who holds the spark of it tenderly within her, the one who herself exemplifies it. Who better to prophesy this coming kingdom than the lowly one, lifted up? In doing so, in prophesying God's kingdom, upending human powers, Mary sings good news for all who are brought low and need lifting up. When I was a clinical pastoral education student, I worked as a chaplain on the burn trauma ICU at Brigham and Women's Hospital and on the surgical step-down floors for that ICU and a different one. As many CPE students do, I ranged all over the hospital, but for the majority of the time, I spent my time with people who were gravely ill or injured. The patients who I was honored to serve among were not, at least in that moment, the powerful. They were resilient and faithful, yes, but also tired and weak, scared and hungry, doubtful. They had been brought low, and many of them were feeling it. I was blessed to be invited by many patients to spend some time with them and their loved ones where I could pray with them or read to them from sacred scripture from their own traditions. And more often than not, knowing that I was a Christian seminarian, when I was reading to Christian patients from the Bible, they trusted me to choose what to read and pray over. I was unfortunately woefully unprepared for this, having an embarrassingly bad recall of scripture, so I picked a couple of standbys that I could dog ear in my Bible and return to when invited. The 23rd Psalm, a classic, though sometimes too reminiscent of funerals for people's comfort in the hospital. The beginning of John's Gospel, beautifully poetic, though sometimes a little too much so to make sense amidst pain and weariness. And the third was the Magnificat. I read this scripture over and over again that summer. It was what I needed, and many times as well what my patients needed. It is not maybe the most obvious choice, but it was a treasured one. Because through it, patients and I were able to converse about and hold their struggles. Fears for their health and recovery, questions about where God could be in the suffering that they were experiencing. We held together with Mary the pain of being brought low and the faithful hope that God would accompany, transform, and transcend that pain with them. With Mary, we proclaimed God's favor, God's presence, God's unending promise. This scripture offers a vision of God's peaceful kingdom, come to reign among us, but it is a vision of peace that knows struggle, hope that knows disappointment, and faith that knows tests. Mary, aware of her people's history, proclaims that history and prophesies a just and peaceful kingdom in covenant with God anyway. Mary, pregnant with Jesus, knows what she has said yes to and says yes anyway, claiming that through God, all will be turned upside down. Through Mary, poor prophetess of God's upside down kingdom, we can see that through God, honor is due to all, but particularly to those who are downtrodden and dishonored. 
Honor is due to the people conquered and subjugated by imperial powers. Honor is due to the hungry and the lowly. Through drawing near to this upside down vision of honor and covenant, community and faith, hope and a coming kingdom, we may begin to know true peace. Amen. Church, we now come to our time of communion, that time when we come to this table to remember the body of Christ, to be the body of Christ gathered here. This is God's table. It's not Wellesley Village's table. It's not the UCC's table. It is Christ's table where all of us are invited. Christ says, come, come and I will give you rest, all you who are weary. So whoever you are, wherever you are on your faith journey, you are welcome at this table. This morning, it is Advent, and we will be celebrating communion in a slightly different format that may be familiar to some of you. Part of our communion liturgy are sung. You will find most of the tunes familiar, but the words may seem fresh. So I invite you to follow along in your bulletin. Uh, We will be serving communion today by coming up the center aisles and receiving the bread and the cup from pastors who will be here in front of the chancel. If you are sitting in one of the transepts, please go down the side aisles and then come up the center aisle just to keep everyone flowing smoothly. And as you are walking about the sanctuary, I would invite you to find the images of God on the wall. This is part of our confirmation class. It's one of the cherished and beloved traditions of that program. Every year, uh, the children, the confirmands, and the advisors are invited to select one or a few of these images of God and explain how they see God's image in it. So I invite you to join them, uh, albeit asynchronously, in seeking those images and finding what God might be saying to you this day. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
Let us pray. Indeed, God, we give you thanks and praise for who you are and for your coming to us over and over again. From the beginning of time, you have blessed this creation with light and life and called all people to know themselves as made in your image and filled with your breath. In this Advent season of hope and peace, we remember your prophets who called to us, who spoke of hope for a day when justice would roll down like an ever-flowing stream, and who taught us that peace is found when we do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with you. In this holy season, when with Christians everywhere we prepare for the birth of the Prince of Peace in Emmanuel. We join our voices together with all those who forever sing to your glory. In the fullness of time, your word took on flesh. You came among us, born of Mary, whose yes invited your incarnation, parented by Joseph, whose love protected and nurtured a refugee family. Raised in a community of faith, you became for us God's word incarnate in Jesus, Emmanuel, healing the sick, blessing the children, lifting up the downtrodden, and filling the hungry with good things. Jesus was faithful to you in all things, living a human life full of love and tears, laughter and hope and hurt. He prayed to you and gave of himself in every way, even unto death, Dying, he destroyed our death. Rising from the grave, he raises us to new and everlasting life. We gather at this table, remembering his life, our life, lived with him. His life lived through us. We pray that you would make this time together a holy communion.
remember that in the course of his human life, as the shadows of betrayal and desertion gathered round, Jesus gathered his disciples whom he loved. He gathered them for a meal, and when he was at table, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he blessed it, and he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. In the same manner, when supper had finished, Jesus took a cup and he poured wine into the cup and he gave thanks and he blessed it and said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my very life poured out for you and for many. Take it and drink. And so often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Church, the broken bread, we participate in the eternal body of Christ, and through the cup we participate in the covenant of life everlasting. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are ready.
This is the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. And the cup of love and grace poured out for us through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. God of love and peace, we give you thanks for being refreshed at this table where we remember Jesus, Jesus who knew our human lives all the way through and knew that in this complexity there would be times when we did not have the words to pray and so gave us these words to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory a part to play in bringing about God's upside-down kingdom in lifting up the lowly and filling up the hungry. Through our service, through our prayers, and through our gifts of financial offerings, we come together as the body of Christ to do this holy work of hope and peace together. One of the ways that you can do that holy work is through your financial offerings and two particular ways this Sunday morning. One is that if you have brought a gift card for Gift Card Sunday, we are collecting them for families in need in our community, including refugees in our local area. We are partnering with several other houses of faith and other communities to help to resettle these folks and build a new life here. And if you have brought a gift card, you can find the bag up on the communion table. And now let us join in prayer and contemplation of the ways in which we offer ourselves to God in community.
I love how our choir's voices are joined by all of your voices in that moment. Praise be to God for all that love has done. And all that love is doing even now. Your common life is an invitation to be part of that love made real here at Village Church. All of the ways we join together to express God's love to one another and to the world around us. A couple of special notes. In addition to the ongoing gift card offering, which you can continue to participate in throughout Advent, we have a giving tree. You can find links to it online. We have very specific children in mind for each of uh, the names there or the items there, and we need those gifts to be fulfilled by next Sunday. So please, if you're willing, um, go online, find a request, and 
make a, an effort this week to fill it and bring those gifts back by next Sunday. I, and there's also the opportunity to make a poinsettia donation in honor or memory of a loved one, and we need to hear from you soon as well so we can fill the sanctuary with poinsettias by the last Sunday of Advent. I want to say a very special welcome today to a family that has um, been making their home here in Metro West with the help of the Metro West SLE Coalition. And I'm going to ask Christina Matthews to come up and help me with this welcome, or Nick Butler. Um, and please, we're so grateful to be able to say welcome in person today. And I'm going to let Nick um, introduce Good morning, I'm Nick Butler. Um, we'll wait a minute for Kamlanvi to get his wife uh, from uh, the toddler area. Oh, mask down, sure. You can say all that again now. Yes, good morning. <laughs> I'm Nick Butler, for those of you who don't know me. And we'll wait just a minute for Zurfahu uh, to come from the toddler area and uh, with their youngest son. And I'll introduce them all to you. Please come up and let us meet you and greet you and welcome you. Thank you. Okay, where everybody can see. So this is Kamlanvi and Zurfahu and their family, youngest son Harris and older son Hosni, who's been making gingerbread house this morning. We can't wait to see what he's made. And we'd like to have you all welcome them to our church here. Village Church is a sponsoring church for them they uh, have left their home country in West Africa from Togo and are seeking a new life here in this community. And um, we want to support them. We feel blessed to support them. And we welcome your support as well. Thank you. take one moment to say, I'm Christina, Nick's wife. Um, it has been such a blessing for us to get to know this family. Um, I think we first met maybe in July this past summer, and as Nick said, uh, Wellesley Village Church um, is part of the Metro West Asylee Coalition, and so there's been a group of churches that has been helping to um, support Zerfahu, Kumlanbi, and the kiddos the last few months. And um, you know, I'll, I'll take a moment just to, to speak for them and saying I know how grateful they are, and it has been life-changing, and in fact, it has been life-changing for us also to um, be able to get to know them and build our relationship. And so we are grateful to this church also for um, all that uh, we've been able to do to support them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. And Nick Kramlavi and Zerfalo and Hosni and Harris, you make our world better and brighter for being in it with us. We are so grateful to be part of your story and to have you be part of our story and to be part of what God is doing. Um, we wish all good things and only good things for you and your family as you start a new chapter of life here. And we want to surround you with our love, our tangible care, and our prayers. Let us pray. God who takes flesh and dwells among us. We give you thanks for the opportunity to be family together, to and with and for one another, across all kinds of challenges and barriers and differences, you find our humanity and help us find it in one another. We pray for Kamlavi and Zerfalu and Hosni and Harris we pray for all families who are refugees seeking asylum and welcome and new life. God, make us instruments together of your grace, your hope, your peace. And may all people know justice and joy. 
Through Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen. Before we conclude our worship with a blessing and a little bit more music, I want to offer a very special welcome to any of you who are here visiting for your first or one of your first times. We are so glad to have you here. You are welcome and a vital part of this worship and this body of Christ gathered here. If you are new and you would like to have a, a brief word with our lead pastor, Sarah Butter, uh, after worship and before heading into the slightly frenzied atmosphere of coffee hour, please, you can find Reverend Sarah at the welcome banner in the sanctuary after the worship ends. And now receive this final blessing. Church, may the love of God, may the hope and peace of Jesus Christ and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and every day. Amen.
our worship has ended.